Hey, how's it going, how's it Gary? Going? How are you? How are you? Very good. Awesome. Good. So I do have a question right off the bat. Okie doke. Yes. <laughs> what is it? Am I supposed to be calling in on my phone or just no. use my earphones on the computer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you. Because you see, I have two different headsets yeah. <laughs> based on what your direction would be. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, right, one so that well done. You're organized the other yeah, way. Yeah. Which is great. And by fair bit, you do mean an extensive <laughs> background check, excluding my social security number. I was like, they got everything. <laughs> that was in the fine print. Didn't you see it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> extensive yeah. research. Yes. Good job. <laughs> then we're awesome, ready to rock and roll. All right. We're good. Okay. Brilliant. <laughs> so, hey. It's not that new. There we go. Is it? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> now we I feel it. better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now the body's ready. You've got all your juices in you. Uh, everything else is sorted as well. <laughs> you just right. some sunshine. That's, yeah, that's yeah. right. I know. I actually went outside and just like opened up. I was like, okay, more vitamin D. I need you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's shining for me now. Okay. Cool stuff. Well, good afternoon there, Karen Millsap. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast today. No, well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you guys. Woo, Likewise. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we, we have a, a lot to thank uh, one of our previous guests, uh, Michael O'Brien, who has introduced probably our last three guests to us <laughs> on the show. <laughs> and um, he's just such an amazing guy and such a great connector, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He is a machine. Thank you, Michael, for connecting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you guys actually sort of, you know, find out about each other? You know, somebody asked me that not long ago, and it made me think we were connected through another um, person in our network. And so he's actually up in the Northeast area of the United States where uh, I'm originally from, but it wasn't until I moved to Florida that somebody connected us. And just because we, we shared a story of going through our worst times and using that as a shift in our mindset. And so we really connected on that. And so our relationship outside of that network connection is really what made our, our relationship kind of grow and flourish. Yeah, that's really wow. nice. Yeah. And you both have really incredible stories to share. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then talking about where you kind of grew up, um, you know, maybe you can sort of take us back to those early years from, from what I understand is you grew up uh, in Montgomery County on an Air Force base uh, yeah. which is, uh, or you were born there as well. So maybe you can just tell us what that was like. What was it like growing up on an Air Force base? And yeah. Yeah, well, actually, I didn't grow up there. So that's the funny thing about being an Air Force kid is you can be born somewhere and then six months later, that's not your home anymore. And so that's what <laughs> happened for me. I was born at Andrews Air Force Base right outside of Washington, D.C. But then we ended up moving to, um, I think we were actually in northern Illinois. I don't remember. I was so young. <laughs> and then <laughs> and when I was two years old, though, is when we moved to Japan. And so the reason why I don't remember even those first formative years, I guess, is because I actually thought I was from Japan. We were there. <laughs> from, yeah, so we were there. I moved there when I was two and I moved back to the States when I was seven. And I remember when we came back, I asked my parents, when are we going home? Because I thought Okinawa, Japan was home. Wow. So I, it was beautiful there. I love Japan. I mean, my one of my goals is to go back and maybe have a little hut on the beach. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but I just remember going to the cherry blossom festivals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had a mama-san who was teaching us Japanese. And as a matter of fact, my first puppy's name was Skoshi because it was a little dog. And that means little in Japanese. <laughs> so I, I really, um, I think that our best station for me as, as a kid was Okinawa, Japan. Uh, after we left there, I spent a couple of years right outside of St. Louis in O'Fallon, Illinois. And then uh, we moved to Dover, Delaware. I remember, which I was like, Delaware, what? It's actually the first state, if you guys didn't know, which you might okay. not. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> I had no idea, never heard of it. Um, but it's a very, very small, it is the smallest state um, in the United States. And so we moved there and I was there from fifth grade until I graduated high school. Um, so usually people are like Delaware and I'm like, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, wow. and then after, uh, high school is when I went to DC and I, I found, I stumbled across George Mason university when I was deciding what college I wanted to go to because of my up 
upbringing as an Air Force kid. We were raised in very diverse cultures. You know, as you mentioned, living on the base, it was like we were on our own community, whether we were overseas or whether we were stateside. Just the community that you have with the military families is it's really, um, there are no lines, right? There are no divisions. We're, we're all one. So being around that diverse culture growing up is really what shaped my decision on even what university to go to because I knew that I needed to be around diversity. So yeah, it was an adventurous, uh, it was an adventurous childhood, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. So, so what is your yeah. Japanese? No, it's gone. I wish. <laughs> and the only thing that I can say is what I'm ordering on the menu if I go to a Japanese restaurant like a Nice. So, so what, what is it actually like uh, on an Air Force base? Is it uh, quite sort of like decadent? Is, is you got all your supplies? Is it, is it basic? What is it like? Yeah, you know, it's very... It is the ideal minimalist community because you have one gas station, you have one BX, which is the base ex exchange, or if it's army, it's the post exchange, the, the PX, but that's like your target or you know your, your just general store. And then you have a commissary, that's your grocery store. I mean, what, so you can literally just do everything you need to do all of your errands in one parking lot. <laughs> and so it's super convenient, but more so what I remember about being on base was you could run outside and your neighbors were taking care of you like you were their child. And so as a matter of fact, when I lived in Japan, um, I was riding my bike up and down the cul-de-sac. And I remember riding my bike down this hill as fast as I could because I was a tomboy and I'm very adventurous, <laughs> but I was going down as fast as I could and I flipped over my bike and actually like scraped my face against the sidewalk. Uh, I know, I know, blood, I know, I don't like that <laughs> image. But, but um, I came up and like, you know, I actually have a huge scar on my chin from that experience, but the neighbor saw this happen. She picked me up carried me into the house. My mom, who reacted just like you, Gareth, was like, wait, blood? No, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, the neighbor helped to tend to me. And then, you know, they got me into the car to take me to the hospital. But I mean, that's just kind of the environment, regardless of, again, if you were overseas or if you were stateside, that community, it was that family feel. It's a great feeling. And the diversity aspect, it, it, it sounds really great. What do you mean by that? Were they just lots of different people that lived on a base? Would you um, learn to just make friends with, with everyone from different backgrounds or? Yes, yes, exactly. All of that. So, you know, what's interesting is when people see me, the first question is, what are you? <laughs> like they can't figure yeah. out what I am. And I had a hard time even self-identifying of I'm this or that. And, and just so everybody knows, I'm a little bit of everything. Like we did the genealogy tree and we come from all over the world. But Aren't I think we all? It, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. But I think that part of that is, um, is I was raised around so many different cultures. And the people that we interacted with, you know, it wasn't actually just the people who were serving in the military, but, you know, there were civilians, depending on your location, and even if you were international, there were civilians and locals mm. that were also working on the base. So you were exposed um, to the culture that you were living in. Or before you were able to get into base housing, it, for example, in Okinawa, we lived off base. So, you know, we were living just in, in the small little streets. You know, I had a gravel driveway at the end of our way, at the end of our apartment street. So we were just immersed in that culture. And I think because of that, me personally, even when people say, what are you? I don't identify with one thing. I'm, I'm thinking I'm human. You know, what do you mean by that? Um, and so we were so connected and so immersed in our culture that I, it's very common. I see this with my sisters and even with my friends um, that we are just more open to diversity and we actually look for that in our engagements, mm -hmm. in our relationships, in our workspace, in the universities that we choose. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was, and, and also, you know, I think that because we were all there with that commonality of being displaced almost, you know, so we bound together, again, we didn't see any differences in religion or race or economic status, you know, that, that just wasn't even a thing, because guess what, we all lived on base housing, so they were very cookie cutter houses, you're yeah. not seeing much difference in that, you know, it just, 
it was one of those, again, it didn't matter what your background was. It doesn't matter um, your, your, even your culture. Everybody is welcome. Mm, that's so cool. Well, now you can tell people when they ask you, you can go, oh, I'm ridiculously human. Then you got an answer. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. You're so right. I love it. But I, I, love I, it. I guess, Karen, off the back of that, you know, the, the moving around can, I suppose, be challenging for, for a youngster, you know, like this in terms of stability and that kind of thing. But as you mentioned, the upside is, is diversity. But I also guess you also learn to be quite adaptable to change. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, my sister and I were only three years apart. My, the sister that's just older than me and then I have an elder sister. But um, she and I, because we were so close in age, we experienced more of the traveling together. My sister, who's older, she graduated high school by the time we were in um, uh, Japan. So we were still young. And there was a huge difference in my desire for the next location and, and relocation and her yearning to stay because of her connection with her friends and the relationships that she built. I was always like, oh, I'm okay. I have my friends and we'll keep in touch. We'll write each other. That's when we actually wrote letters. <laughs> and, uh, we'll keep in touch, but I'm ready for the new adventure when, you know, for my sister, Jessica, she more so uh, enjoyed those relationships. So I do think that it's different just based on, you know, how you're naturally wired and created. Um, but I do think that um, that was kind of the fun for me was that my friends, I always had friends in different locations. And so it wasn't until I moved to Delaware in fifth grade. I mean, that was the longest that I'd been anywhere from fifth grade until 12th grade. But I still have friends uh, who I'm connected with now on, thank goodness for Facebook, uh, who I was mm -hmm. friends with in Japan or in Illinois, you know, when I was in second or third grade. As a matter of fact, I found out that one of my friends from second grade, that she lived like 20 miles from me in Orlando and we hadn't been in touch for like 25 years. Isn't wow. that crazy? That's <laughs> so cool. Yes, yes, yes. I so saw a really I funny meme actually just while you were talking about that recently. It was really funny. It was like, um, happy birthday uh, on Facebook, right? Happy birthday, Johnny, from that one time we met on a dance floor in 1998, you know, like you have these papers <laughs> yeah. you put on Facebook that you're like, who even is this person? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, but, you know, to your point, Craig, I do think that um, moving around did help to develop that kind of resilient um, uh, characteristic that I have and adaptability. Um, because again, in my mind, even when I was going through those changes, I didn't see them as challenges. They were exciting to me. Mm -hmm. So even now in my business, when I experience any kind of challenge or a, there's a setback or anything, you know, I just feel like it's built in me and it was honed in on during those early years. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what comes out now. Yeah. yeah so cool. It's so interesting how like our childhood has such an influence on us and the way we are when we're older and you know, like often those, those lessons that we learn, we carry on with us throughout our lives. Uh, what, yeah. were your, what were your folks actually doing on the Air, base, on the Air Force Base? Uh, my dad had a lot of different jobs. So he, uh, he started off as a dental technician when he, this is before, you know, my sister and I were even thought of. Um, but by the time I was born, he was working in the hospital as a hospital administrator. And when I retired, he was uh, one of the hospital administrators. So he was like top rank. And then when he retired, he retired uh, due to a medical disability. So who knows where he would have gone after 21 years. Mm -hmm. um, but he actually went in without a, any sort of degree or, or education, only his high school diploma. And he was able to change his job and move up in the ranks because he continued his education while he was serving. And mm -hmm. so he ended up, you know, getting his associate it's his bachelor, his master's, and that's how he was able to kind of change around uh, in that space so much. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, what an example. Uh, yeah, exactly. What an example. And and talking about your folks and about your your dad, um, sort of um, not being that well, and then but you also spoke about resilience. You said that they are like kind of the epitome of resilience. And um, you know, your dad's had a, a, a tough time. Um, you know, he's had a rare neurological um, disease, PLS, which is primary lateral sclerosis. And he's also survived cancer three times. Um, and your mom has been his carer for 15 years. I can only imagine that has been pretty traumatic for, for everyone involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting because you 
you don't recognize how much something is needed until it impacts your circle, your family or your circle of friends. Um, and it's unfortunate there are so many diseases out there that do not have the funding that they need to get the research um, kind of implemented so that they can find a cure. And PLS is one of those. So he, I remember actually the day that he had his first um, experience or side effect, I should say, with PLS. We had our dog Skoshi, remember Japanese? Yeah. Means Small. And we're, that's right, that's right. And we were running around our backyard um, in, in Illinois, Scott Air Force Base. So we were running around and there was this ledge that my dad was going to jump up because he was chasing the dog. And my dad was very athletic. He played all sorts of sports. Basketball was his main sport. And his leg froze and he couldn't get up. So he skinned his knee. And I mean, I, I remember the gash and everything. I literally remember this moment, which is wow. funny because, you know, most of the things we don't remember. But I asked him years later, he said that was his first inclination that something was wrong because his leg would never stiffen up like that. It was very strange and unusual. But now, um, due to PLS, he, the, the nerves that are connected to our brain have deteriorated and his mobility has um, weakened significantly. So over the past you know, 20 years, he's gone from running around and, and playing with his kids to using a cane and then a walker and you know, even an electric uh, wheelchair to get around long distances. Um, but there's not a lot of research that's done to find a cure. And although he did do a little bit of his own research to get connected like via the internet to other people who may have this rare disease around the world, you know, again, everybody, they experience it so differently. Um, some people, it came on quickly within six months. Um, other people didn't lose their mobility, but they lost their voice. That's another side effect. He can't really project his voice. Um, but what, what I can say about my dad is, you know, I can't remember as I look back at this, he, he retired from the Air Force because of this disease when I was in eighth grade. I can't remember any moment of struggle or anger or bitterness from wow. him ever, literally ever. I have never once heard him complain, even when he went through cancer. Hmm. And I was talking to my mom about that hmm. because for me, I do feel bad that it took me losing my husband for my mind to be open to the different uh, forms and variations of grief and loss and change. And my father being the, you know, the provider for the family and you heard very ambitious about school and work. And then all of a sudden, not just being a prisoner in his own body, mm -hmm. his brain works perfectly fine. He can write a message. If you get a text message from him, it's going to be a book because he's getting every <laughs> thought out there. But you know, it's, it's unfortunate because I, I didn't recognize how much that probably did impact him. Um, you know, he can't provide for his family. Things have changed in, in certain ways. You know, he can't um, walk his daughters down the aisle without assistance of his walker. And, and can't, I mean, just so many can't call to pay a bill, doesn't go to the grocery store because he can't drive anymore. But yet, in the 15, maybe it's even been 18 years that he's had this, never once complained. Never once, you know? So, so yeah, it's one of those things where, and I've talked to him about this, especially after my husband died, and I just kind of said, man, I'm so sorry that I missed this, that I didn't even see this. And he said, you're not supposed to see it. You know, you're my daughter, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And, but I did tell him, I said, I now I know where I get my resilience from because, <laughs> you know, and I, I do, I see this with widows who have gone through prolonged deaths, you know, maybe there was an illness that took their, their husband or their wife. And, um, and so the grieving process starts when you become a caregiver. Mm -hmm. So in some way, shape or form, my mom, although she, you know, takes care of him with an open heart and with so much love and, and, and does it unselfishly and very willingly, although that ha I know that there is a grieving process in that as well. And so the fact that she has also been able to remain so strong and, you know, in stride with all of these different ailments that have come up outside of just the neurological disease, mm -hmm. I say, you know, I see where I get it from. And when I say that, I mean, because I get it from both of them equally, they have played such a tremendous role in my life in, in, in setting that example and just showing me what it really looks like to to roll with the punches and to keep a good attitude and to keep your faith 
and, and to show up in a way that makes still a positive impact on other people's lives. Sure. So how has she been? Has she been like, um, I mean, obviously equally strong, but has she, has she been more like, you know, it's really tough and, you know, has she had that side or has she also just been, let's go, let's take care of this? Or how's her sort of attitude been towards all that? That's actually a really great question. We didn't start to have some of those more raw conversations until I became even more uh, open about my grief because initially, and I know we'll get to this part of the story, but I wasn't really sharing my grief of losing my husband until I had to do some of the internal work. And then as I started to share some of that with my parents, because they've been the closest people to me during this time, Mm -hmm. um, my mom did open up about things that she struggled with. And and some of those like really deep hearted, gritty prayers of like, you know, how do I get through this? What do I do? So it wasn't until later. And again, I understand why maybe they um, sheltered us from all of the rough spots in the early years. Um, but it hasn't stopped, you know, there's still challenging moments. And I appreciate that she has shown that side of me because I think for us as parents, I have a little one, the best way that we can set an example for our children is to show them what it is to, like to be human, the good and the bad. So that nice. way, when they go through those tough times, they don't feel like there's something wrong with me because I'm processing this in a very emotional way. No, that's that's part of it. And so she has shared that with me, um, but it's been more so in recent years. Mm. I, I think it's so important like to, to see your folks cry and these sort of things. Cause actually, I mean, I hardly ever remember like my folks crying, you know, the, the, the one time I can recall was um, yeah, it was like my stepdad when uh, basically they were doing some renovations on the house and like this water, like pipe just burst and the whole top floor was basically just completely swamped in water and uh, and he was uh, like I just heard this like wallowing and I was like what is that noise (laughs) and I ran upstairs and it was my stepdad like because you know like building a house is like an emotional thing and 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 then he just had his head on the and the hands on the bed and he was he was crying I was like oh my word and that was like almost one of the first times I kind of experienced that sort of emotion and you don't really see your parents doing that there. So like you said, it's important to actually show both of those sides. Mm-hmm. But, Absolutely. But it's fascinating because I, I could imagine as a parent in some way that you like want to protect them from that. I, I would imagine, you know, like, you know, like, oh, I, I don't want to so, show sadness. Like, you know, mm-hmm. and also I could also imagine that you'd think I need to be a role model and say like, you can get through stuff which positive, you know. But actually, yeah. maybe maybe that's not necessarily the right sort of way of, of, to go about it, as you, as you just said. Well, I think that there's a balance, right? Because I think that our duty as parents is more so to preserve their innocence, right? I think that is more so of like what we should do to protect them as they're younger. But I don't think that means that we need to protect them from all things that are real. And, you know, feeling overwhelmed when you have water damage in your house, or if you're in the middle of it, like that is real, you know, feeling, and I've actually had moments where if I lose my cool and I allow myself to go there, because thankfully I am very conscious, but it's taken a lot of work to get there. But if I lose my cool, I will go back and either apologize to my son if it's directed towards him in a moment of frustration, um, or if it's just like me in general with traffic or something, you know, I'll kind of Mm -hmm. talk it through. Because what I don't want to happen, and and again, I didn't learn this or realize the significance of this until after my husband passed, but I I recognize that if I don't show him all the emotions, Mm -hmm. then when he gets to those uncomfortable emotions, then he's going to suppress. And I learned that if you suppress your emotions, they're eventually going to manifest themselves in unhealthy ways. So whether that is anger or whether that is sadness or whether that it doesn't matter, frustration, overwhelm, anything that is bringing discomfort, you have to work through that. And that is the way that it's going to release its stronghold over you. So, you know, again, if, it, if you can protect their innocence by not, you know, exposing them to a whole bunch of like, you know, sex, guns, violence, and all of that, then great. Um, but if you're going through a real moment that it's just part of life, you know, I think that we should lean into vulnerability in those moments. Mm, definitely. Yeah, well said. So just, um, I mean, that's, that must have been a really incredibly tough time for you all. But it, I mean, it, it's amazing that you guys have all taken some positives from the tough times in your lives and, 
it's always a theme that we hear from people that are just thriving at life is that it's not that there aren't tough times. It's just kind of how you deal with them. And it yeah. certainly sounds like you guys have, you know, all of you have sort of got that attitude, which is really inspiring. But how, how was it sort of once you'd moved on from, from the, the, you know, the army base, the air force base life, um, how was it sort of getting back into, let's say, civilian life or normal society again uh, after um, living on these bases? I kind of feel like if we were going to transition out of the comfort of military living, living in community, that Delaware was the best place to do it because it was such a small podunk town, like where we were from. You know, we had like an Amish market where they were making their own cheese and sugar sweets and stuff like that. So it was, it was nice because it was kind of like, uh, you know, that, that show, that old show Cheers, Everybody Knows Your Name is part of the, the song. Uh, that's kind of how it was. It's like, you're just in this small town and, and, um, and it was an easy transition for me, but in this small town, there was less diversity. Now I didn't really have, uh, you know, too hard of a time transitioning because again, I can get along with a pig. Like I'm okay. As long as we're having some sort of fun, we're good. Um, but I can't, I do recognize that when we transition again, we, moved or you know transitioned out of the air force when i was in eighth grade so i was um living off base and we were living off base for a little bit but for my uh high school years and so after four years of kind of being in this town where you know most people were small-minded honestly a lot of people who were from there didn't leave there i was ready for something new and i think again you know we were moving every four years when i was younger now i'd been at this place you know, since I was in fifth grade. Um, so I was ready for a change. It was a nice transition. It was a, a, an easy transition, probably easier than having to like go to a big city and trying to figure out how do you find your space in you know, the midst of millions. Um, but I was definitely ready for more diversity. I was ready for the, the pace of a city, but wanted to be outside of a city. And that's how I ended up landing in at George Mason right outside of DC. Mm. Ah, cool stuff. So, so talking about George Mason, like yeah, that's I guess you, you studied there, and then after that, you kind of mentioned that you fell into your your, your sort of career, which was HR and recruitment, and then uh, some, not long after that, you met your husband Richard too. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. So when I funny thing is, my dad asks me. He's asked asked me this a couple times. I don't know if it's because uh, he doesn't realize he's asked me more than once, but he always says. <laughs> you know, why did you choose your major? My major was communication. And I said, I don't know. I, I like to talk. So that's all I got. <laughs> I had nothing else. <laughs> it wasn't going to be Good science reason. or math. Or, yeah, I was like, that's all I knew. And so it served me well. But when I graduated, what do you do with communication? Like if you're going to go into journalism or, you know, PR, which that really wasn't my desire. And so because I had such a great experience at George Mason, I had been one of their ambassadors or student ambassadors during my four years there. And so when I graduated, I actually got a job in the admissions office and I was one of their um, undergraduate recruiters. So I would travel and I would um, talk to high school students and recruit them to come to George Mason. And so there came just a, a, a life change where my roommate was moving on. And so I said, okay, well, I need a better paying job than this. I was making peanuts at that time. But what I liked about the job was the recruiting piece and helping people to kind of navigate their way through change and transition. So as I honed in on that part of the job that I liked, uh, that's how I ended up in staffing and recruiting. And mm. staffing more so, I didn't realize it at the time, but I should have known this was a red flag during the interview process. Um, the VP, we were, I was on the last round of the interviews and she said, well, why do you want this position? And I told her exactly what I told you. I really enjoy helping people navigate change. And I think that I can help them make a, a great decision um, looking at the whole picture, not just you know one piece of it. And she said, wrong answer. You need to be here for the money. I was like, okay, well. No way. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and so, and you know what? I mean, I was young, so I was like, okay, money. Yeah, actually, that's why I need to make this change anyway. And I did really well. You know, I was crushing the numbers, but I was also burning myself out. I remember having an emotional breakdown after about two months of working there. And even though I was crushing the numbers and I was, you know, hitting all these bonuses, I was just drained and it was enough wow. for me. So I transitioned out of there and I decided again, what do I love about this? I love the recruiting aspect. So I decided to go into um, 
corporate recruiting, so in-house recruiting. And that is where I was exposed to more of the HR functions. I was part of a change initiative. So I was working through like new process rollouts. I was doing a lot of training um, and it was fun. I mean, it was great. And yes, it was there when I met Richard, when I fell in love and it's always a boy, right? It's always love. <laughs> But, um, but that's when I'm I met kidding. him and yeah, that's when I met him. And, um, and it was, I was working there, but he actually, uh, was taking an opportunity to play basketball up in Vermont. So we were in the DC area at the time and they allowed me to work virtually for uh, a few months. And I went up to Vermont with him, but I was kind of over the DC area at that time. You know, I've been there five, maybe six years and when he wrapped up his season in Vermont is when we decided to move down to, to Florida. Oh, mm. Nice. Wow. It sounds like, uh, yeah, it, once again, that, that whole moving and change is definitely part of your, your fabric, isn't it? And <laughs> that's right. That's right. You can't stay in one place for too long. <laughs> so at this stage, Karen, things were, were going pretty well, it seemed and, and, uh, and swimmingly in your life. And, at 29, tragedy actually struck your life um, and it would change uh, forever when uh, Richard, your husband, who you'd been in love with, uh, was, was murdered. Yeah. In an instant, everything changed. In an instant. It's so sad. Like, what actually happened? So we were, um, we were living in Orlando and I was working as a recruiter and the day that this happened, I had, um, an, I had interviews that I needed to do from home, which I normally didn't do. I was very good as, as far as like leaving work at work, um, specifically because Richard had just opened up a CrossFit gym. And so we were about six months into business. And so once I left work, I was, you know, coming to the next phase of life, which was picking up the kids and um, helping him with the gym. And just so so it was very unusual for me to have to do um, any interviews after hours, but I was interviewing um, some VPs. And so that was their availability. So that morning I remember texting them and just saying, Hey, you know, my schedule is now going rolling over to the evening. I have some interviews to do. Do you want me to pick up the kids or do you want me to just go home and you can bring them home later? And so he said, no, you know, they've missed you. So uh, why don't you come pick them up? And so I said, okay. And, um, so I went, I picked up the kids and I got a phone call from someone while I was on my way to get them. And so he just piled them into the car. I gave him a wave and, and left. Um, so when I got home, I, my son was two at the time and we had my stepdaughter with me, which is why I say kids. Um, but she, uh, I dropped her off at her mom's house before I, I went home. And so my son was sitting in front of the TV. I just got him situated and I was on my first call on the first interview. I had three of them scheduled. So I was on the interview and I was using the house phone, but my cell phone was vibrating. And so I noticed it had been vibrating for a while, but because it was face down, I wasn't really thinking about it. It was a call, probably was thinking it was an alarm or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I finally turned it over and I saw that it was a missed call from one of the women who was a member at our gym. And so I thought to myself, Hmm, that's interesting. Well, maybe Richard hurt himself. So I don't know if either of you CrossFit have you all been a CrossFit no. box? Yeah, we know. Yeah. Yeah. No, of the CrossFit right. boxes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. So, you know, we have those big rigs, right? Yeah, so yeah. in my mind, I'm thinking he fell off the rig. Yeah. Maybe he broke his arm. Maybe he hit his head, which is why she's calling me. So finally, the candidate um, was answering a question, and I put him on mute to answer her phone call just to say, hey, is everything all right? What's up? You know, yeah. I'm doing an interview. And all I heard was screaming. No and worries. I couldn't make out um, like what she was saying. I honestly don't even remember if I was hearing people in the back as well, but it just sounded like complete pandemonium. And then finally, the only word I could make out was shot. And it was like, it was instant. As soon as I heard that word, my body just started trembling. It's like it was going into convulsions. And so I had to gather myself because remember I had the candidate on the phone. So 
I got off the phone with her. I hit unmute with him and tried to, with a steady voice, say, thank you so much for your time. We'll be in touch with next steps in the next week or so and just hurry up and get off the phone. And so I picked up my son and um, I remember bouncing him because my first thought was, I don't want him to feel what's happening to my body. And then, you know, for that to trigger something in. And so I took him to the neighbor's house and I just said, if you can watch him, you know, I'll, I don't know what happened at the gym, but something happened. She said, sure. I go a hundred and something down the highway. And it wasn't until, um, until the light right before the gym that I, I remember thinking to myself, why am I not on my way to the hospital? Because if this woman had called me several times and I didn't answer for a few minutes, and if it took me at least 10 minutes to get here, after all this time, if he was shot, we should be headed to the hospital. And so I pull up and it's just, there's first responders everywhere. There's news reporters there. There's news trucks out there. There's people from the community. There's people from church. I mean, it was just, um, it was chaos. And, um, and I don't remember who told me or when they told me, uh, that he died and, and died instantly. Um, but that, that was the night that my, that my life changed. Wow. So sad. Like, I can't believe like, like so, so just someone came and just shot, shot him. Like, do they, do they know who the person is? What, what actually happened? No. So six years later, they still don't um, have the shooter identified or um, he, so the story, I didn't ask a lot of questions. Uh, The people who were in there, Richard was teaching a class when this happened and the person walked in and he was standing by the chalkboard, I think writing people's times or something. And it was a guy. So this guy must've said something and he turned around and the guy shot him and he, um, and he died instantly because this, this man shot him in the head. Mm-hmm. And he, um, there was a getaway driver. And so he got in the car. Um, we mm-hmm. were in an industrial park area. So somebody, one of the other tenants, I think, tried to follow them for a little bit. Um, but no, nope, to this day, we still don't have, they did, you know, they said, well, clearly this was a hit, but we can't find the motive. Wow. No, no one could like ID him or anything that saw it. Mm-mm. No. Mm-mm. Oh, they were working out. Oh, wow. That's so oh. sad. And, um, and yeah, sorry. Go, go. No, no, go for it. Go for no, I'm done. Um, so, I mean, I mean, it's really impossible really for us to kind of fathom how, how you must take news like that. Like so much go, must go through your mind. Like what now? And, what about our son and like, where do you, where do you begin? Hmm. So the first night, um, I re- I remember being at the crime scene and sitting behind a bush, just rocking back and forth, just saying, this isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't real. Cause that's, that's just all I, I couldn't even think. Um, at some point you are thinking now what? That's exactly what you're thinking because you just, you don't even know what direction to go. Um, When we were there at the crime scene, at one point, a police officer came up to me and said, Mrs. Millsap, you're going to have to call someone to clean up in there. Mm. And so when he said this, I remember thinking, first I was thinking, what the hell? Like, I'm, I mean, you know, I, I say I, I say it lightly now, but I, it was very, it was with a lot of anger when I was in my head, like, just, I can't even believe that this person has said this to me. And so I got out. I said, well, what do you mean? Like, who do I call? I, no, actually I said, isn't that something you all do? And he said, no. And I said, well, who do I call? And he said, crime scene cleanup. And I said, oh, well, really? how do I even find them? Yeah. And his response was, you can look in the yellow pages. No ways. No, hmm. like, sympathy nothing that's unbelievable Mm -hmm. and this is like a day this is like a day or two later no this is at the crime scene that night wow oh my god while we're standing in the parking lot and so as i was standing there um thankfully uh my pastor was there and he came right over to me and he said um karen don't worry about it we'll take care of it and I, I, re- I remember even before he came up to me in that space, I remember thinking to myself, this is my first responsibility as a widow. 
And then I was thinking, wait, wow. I'm a widow. Like I, I just couldn't. And so, you know, Craig, to your point, it was like, now what, like, what is, what does that even mean? Mm-hmm. But when you, when you go through something and I can't speak for everybody's experience, but in this kind of traumatic experience, you literally can't think about what to do next. Yet the only thing that was given to me was an insensitive remark of, Hey, now you got to go clean up in there. Like it, so I couldn't even try to think about what to do next because, you know, this was just dumped on me. I'm so sorry that you had yeah. to go through that. That's just like really, really sad that, um, yeah, that someone would even, even say that. And, and the, the whole thing is just really, really tragic and, and traumatic. Um, you also ended up losing like a lot of your possessions, your house, your car, your job, and, and so many other things. Um, was that kind of like soon after and, and how, how did that sort of come about and why? For about a year um, after Richard died, it was like a domino effect of all these things that just started happening. And of course, you know, some of that is a given in transition um, when you're downsizing or what have you. But so the first thing that happened was I had to make a decision that I had to let go of this car because I couldn't afford it. And it doesn't sound like a big deal. You know, that may even sound like a materialistic comment, but it had nothing to do with the car. The reason we got this car was because it was bigger than the car that I had just turned in because we were trying to have more kids at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was less about the fact that it was a car. It was a symbolism of the life Mm -hmm. that we were creating together. And by me saying, I can't even afford this thing and I need to turn it in, it was letting go of you know, just the hopes and the dreams and the plans that we would created for ourselves. Um, so that was the first thing that I had to let go of. Um, I ended up losing a lot of different relationships, friendships, and uh, I ended up losing my house because again, you know, we were a family of four and now, uh, you know, I'm a family of one and a half. And so as I'm transitioning out, uh, as I make the decision that I need to sell the house, I remember everybody saying, oh, don't sell the house for a year. And I'm like, I feel like I'm suffocating here. Like I can't even be in my home. It's so, so I put my house on the market and it was on the market for like an astronomical amount of time. It ended up selling. And then two days before closing, the deal was off the table because the buyers were being investigated by the FBI for fraud. Oh, oh no! So now oh, my no. house is in boxes and I'm trying oh. to figure out, well, what do I do? Do I take it off the market? Do we live in boxes through the holidays? Like wh- I, I, I don't even know what to do at this point. Um, finally it sold and it sold maybe two weeks before um, Thanksgiving. So it was like the middle of uh, November. I closed on a Friday in November. Oh, I'm sorry. It sold in October. I was closing in November. I closed on a Friday. I walked in the next Monday and was let go. So, so within a year, yes, the house, the car, the job relationships, all that. It was like, and I actually mentioned this on, um, very briefly on my Ted talk. I said it was, and it was during this time of all of the craziness with the house that I had a pain attack. And my pain attack was like, again, you know, we think that grief just comes because of a death, but it really does come from so many losses and changes. And I mean, you know, losing the life that you thought that you were working so hard towards, right? That's a huge uh, moment to grieve. And because all of these different things were just crumbling and I felt like I was losing everything in my life. Um, I laid there and I felt pain from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. And it was, it was excruciating. And I was just crying. I'm in this puddle of water and I'm just like, God, what is going on? Like, why are you doing this? Why is all of this happening? I don't understand why you are ripping everything away from me. Mm -hmm. And you know, because we, I think that in general, we're kind of taught that if you do good, then you're going to live good. Life is going to be fine. You're going to be, you know? And it's not, it's unfair. You know, there's suffering, there's struggles, there's just, there's mistreatment, there's, there's disease, there's all of this stuff out there that can make life really, really difficult. Mm. So when I found myself in that place where everything just seemed hard and unfair and, and, and like it was literally suffocating me, I was just asking why. 
And I couldn't Oops. really figure out like what, you know, what direction to go. And then it, it was like something washed over me to just surrender that I may not understand the why behind everything, but if I just surrender to the journey and if I keep my heart in check, that I'll be, that I'll be able to survive this. Sure. Life certainly has a strange way of like teaching us lessons. Hey. And yep. Really strange, yeah. But can we like the choose pain our was, plans? <laughs> well, tell us more. Like the, the pain was it just did it hit you suddenly and and just sort of you know? Um, or so, had, it, had you had pain before? Or was it just this? I don't know. Just it sounds really scary and and yeah. just a horrible experience. So after Richard died, I was kind of living in this space where I was. Um, some people say that they feel this uh, consistent nausea. For me, I felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was suffocating. Like that's just, the, I kind of felt like I was drowning. That was the best way to put it. And I, now I, as I say that, I think because drowning is one of my biggest fears, I wonder if that's kind of what was manifesting in that space. But in that moment, what happened was I was crying so hard that my jaw and my neck started to hurt. <laughs> and they were feeling so tense that I was just like, and then it started to just like move down my shoulders. And then I started to feel like this tightness in my chest, almost as if I was going to have a heart attack. And then I just started feeling like my back was like hurting. Like, you, you know, you can't like pop or, but all this is happening at once, but it started when I was crying and it started from my jaw and kind of moved its way down. Wow. And I remember even like, now remember, I used to CrossFit with my husband, so I know what pain feels like <laughs> after you're doing <laughs> thrusters and squats and all of that. So it was like this excruciating pain that was just going down to, into my lower body, like my ankles feeling like they were locked up. I mean, it's so, it's like everything that you um, would expect or imagine from physical pain, pain it like it's like it hit me all at once but it started because my jaw and my neck was feeling really tense yes. and um and they were hurting and and karen why did the relationships go like what, what i don't understand like was it because you withdrew or was it were people unsupportive or i don't know i think that you know for everybody it's different um you know i can give you one example of a friend who texted me and told me that, you know, I was being selfish and I needed to snap out of it and get mm. over it already. And right. that was maybe October. So that was maybe two, two months. After no ways. Yeah. And I just, you wow. know, when I think of it, I had some people say I wasn't grieving enough or, you know, and I'm like, you're not in my closet <laughs> when I'm breaking down. You're not, you know, in the middle of the night when I'm laying next to my son and just like losing it. Like, so I kind I learned that first of all, I think in, in, in general, we're uncomfortable with other people's feelings and we're yeah. definitely uncomfortable with other people's feelings when it is those negative or, 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 um, really hard and messy emotions. Yes. So what happens is we start to kind of try to con one thing is we may try to console them, but we say things like, oh, time will heal all wounds or, you know, God needed another angel or don't worry, you'll get married again. You're young. Like I was hearing all this stuff very early on and it was wow. so insensitive, but I realized now in hindsight from the work that I've done, it had nothing to do with me or how I was showing up in life. It had everything to do with their response to my grief. And mm. even people sometimes would say, gosh, you're so strong. I don't even, I don't know how you're doing it. And I'm thinking in my head, you don't even realize that I was ready to run my car through a house on the way here. Like I'm losing it in my mind, but because I'm not going ape, you know, they think that yeah. it's some level of strength and there certainly was some judgment with that. So I think mm -hmm. it just really goes back to, you know, we say things either because we're uncomfortable or the other reason is we say things because we're projecting our expectations onto that person, how they should grieve, when they should get over it and things of that nature. When really, if we just were open that, first of all, everybody's pain is different. Two siblings could lose the same parent and feel completely different about it. It's mm. so unique to each individual, the situation, the relationship, how they are made, like how they're, they're wired. 
And so if we could just give some grace and think about this, and I, I say this a lot in my workshops, if you could just think to yourself for a moment before responding to somebody else's grief, if you could just say to yourself, I don't know everything and I can't imagine what they're going through, it immediately breaks this, this barrier down so that you can really show mm -hmm. up and just be empathetic without being judgmental. And so I feel like a lot of the relationships that I lost were coming from either of those spaces because that's what I found just to be the norm and, and how we treat one another in society in general. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks it's, for that. It's, yeah. It's amazing how some people and actually maybe a lot of people are just not in, in tune with, with that side of things and, and being able to be a bit more empathetic and just sit there and listen and uh, maybe try and understand where the other person is coming from because that's often just what you need to do. You know? Just, but, you know, it's yeah. uncomfortable. Right. And I yeah. feel like I wasn't that great at it before, you know, mm. because I couldn't even, I, I couldn't even fathom that level of pain. Mm. And, but I do think that the way that we can show up for, for one another with compassion and with empathy is instead of thinking about just their situation, just reflect on a time where you felt pain. Mm. Exactly. And if you can start there, then that's going to help you show up for this person and not think about all of the details and just relate to them, you know, from one human spirit to another. I know what pain feels like, and I'm sorry that you're going through this. And I may not have all the right words, but I'm, I'm, I am willing to be here with you and walk through it. Yeah, 100%. Um, and, you, and you mentioned that one of the ways that you sort of, I guess, started healing was that you just kind of surrendered to things. But there was another moment when your two-year-old son basically said something to you and that kind of jump-started you uh, on your healing journey as well. Is that right? Yeah, I, um, I said to my, one of my good friends, I said, isn't there a happy pill or something that can like take me out of this like crazy fog? And she said, well, we can go to the physician and, you know, see if we can get you some antidepressants. And so I went to see the physician and she prescribed me a couple of different bottles and I went home and they were sitting on my uh, bathroom counter and I was just looking at them sobbing. I did a lot of crying as I'm sure you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking to myself, is this what my life has come to? where I need to depend on drugs to help me function. And now, listen, there are a lot of um, really good medications out there to help people who have that imbalance. But for me, I felt I was actually really hard on myself thinking, Karen, you should be stronger than this. You should be able to get yourself together. You should be able to pull yourself out. Mm. Um, but in some cases, you need that help, right? So I was just spiraling down this, you know, woe is me mentality. And so I started taking the uh, antidepressants and only two days later, my son came into the room and I didn't realize this, but I had been a zombie for those two days. Mm. And he came into the room and he said, mom, are you going to get up today? Are you going to eat today? And so I thought to myself, First of all, how aware this little boy is, right? For him to, because my parents were there and they were helping out and they were hands on. And it's not like he was having full conversations at two and a half, but you, you he said what he meant to in that moment. Mm. And, and it struck me and I really felt, you know, just God press on my heart. You have two options here. You can either give up or you can get up. It's going to be one of those. And, and the choice is yours. And so it did trigger in me, okay, I have choice here, but I have to, you know, it wasn't just that one moment that made me realize the power of choice. Although when Caleb came into the room, that's when it triggered for me that I needed to jump that into gear. <laughs> um, yeah. The moment when I realized the power of choice was, I was thinking about all of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that were going wrong and that were just spiraling in my life. And I kept think thinking, Things would be different if Richard were here. If this never happened, I wouldn't be going through this or that or the third, and we wouldn't have this, you know, chaos around us. And so as I was, th I kept thinking, if only he were here, if only that didn't happen. And then for some reason, my mind started to think about the man who killed my husband. And I thought to myself, if only he didn't get up that day and decide to go and do this. If mm -hmm. only when he was driving down the road, he decided to turn around. If only when he pulled into the parking lot, he decided to not get out of the car. If only when he got out of the car and walked into the gym, he decided to not pull the trigger. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And I kept thinking he had so many opportunities along the way that day that he could have made a different decision and this would be completely different. And that's when it hit me. That power of choice that he took uh, advantage of, mm. that he used for ill intent, you have the same power to make something good out of this. Now it did mm. that in that moment, it was only that I recognized the power of choice. But I, again, I didn't really fully step into that until my son, who was my light at the end of the tunnel, came in and asked me if I was going to get up. And I made the choice to get up. Wow. That's incredible that you had been such down this deep rabbit hole of thinking about so many things, but through that process of like thinking every possible scenario that it actually triggered something almost positive in you that you're like, I'm going to use this for good. Um, That's, I guess, just a testament to your parents and so many other things like just, you know, having something inside of you that could bring you out of that um, incredibly tough time, I guess, but uh, pretty amazing story that 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 happened. So you, you mentioned some people that, that sort of were not very supportive, but there were also people obviously that were incredibly supportive during that time. I would imagine maybe you could just tell us a little bit of how, how that affected you in a positive way. Yeah. Um, and, and actually before I go there, the one thing that I would add to that, that last piece is yes, it somehow was in me to move forward, but it wasn't like it was a one-time decision. Mm-hmm me deciding to get up was like every day. And it wasn't like big lofty goals. It was like, Oh, I took a shower today. (laughs) Like, great. Mm -hmm. Like that is me getting up, you know? So anybody who's hearing this, I don't want you to feel like there's going to be some grand moment. And then you, all of your energy shifts into this positive direction. But even if you have a little bit of that hope, that's enough for you to take like one little step at a time. Cause that's, that's exactly how it was for me. Um, but about, but, and you know, part of that, part of the reason I had that hope, was also because of the people around me who showed love and unconditional compassion. You know, I mentioned my pastor that he said, don't worry about it. We will go in there and clean up. And you know, I didn't find out until this year when he said that it was actually he who went in there and cleaned up the blood. No ways. He didn't call anybody. It was uh, somebody who went to our gym, told me, he said, I went back the next day to pay my respects. And you know, I I saw our pastor there and, and he was the one cleaning up. And I was like, I mean, talk about, unconditional love and just showing up for somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was so significant. Um, and then my friend, Jamie, who we were not very close or best friends at the time. She was one of the first people, she and her husband who Richard invited just to come work out in our garage before we were even in the gym. She was one of our neighbors And I'm not sure, and I don't even know if she could say what it was that made her do this, um, but she would come every single day. She would just show up and just be there next to me and we would do nothing. You know, we would, if I needed to get out of the house, even if I still had my pajamas on, we'd like walk around Target or something. You know, she would help to make sure that dinner was taken care of for Caleb. Um, She was a nurse, so she had a pretty flexible schedule. And I mentioned her also in my TED talk because I do feel like sometimes we think that we have to have this grand gesture for people in their time of need and you don't, you know, a very small gesture can really reshape somebody's experience. And so I feel like part of me putting one foot in front of the other was also because of those who showed me so much love and who showed up um, in ways that, you know, I wasn't even thinking clearly at times and and they were just there for me. And so Jamie was definitely one of those people. Again, she said that when she heard my Ted talk, she was like, I was crying because I didn't realize that, you know, I thought I was doing nothing. I never thought what I was doing was good enough and I didn't know it impacted you that much. And I was like, yeah, it's usually not something big. And now I know that now, but it's not always something big. It's just, you know, being there. Mm, for sure there, there's some people though that are special you know and maybe they don't necessarily realize it and then jamie certainly sounds like one of them and i think actually like it's kind of like uh sort of intrinsic to nurses you know that's kind of just what they they do and, and how they behave and and maybe they do just take that sort of reaction for granted as well and um uh yeah then she kind of just knew that that's what she just needs to do to help you through it so yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely all need a Jamie in our life. That's for sure. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
you're an incredible lady. Seriously, I just wanted to say thanks so much for sharing that part of it with us. I can only imagine it must be still uh, super difficult to to share that story. Um, but uh, now um, you're thriving um, in terms of your business um, and everything else that you're doing uh, and educating others, giving talks and these sort of things. Um, how have you managed to, I guess, like turn your grief into lessons for others? And then can you maybe just tell us a little bit about uh, your businesses and what you are doing? Yeah, I, I remember thinking early on, and I feel like this was not my own thought, <laughs> but <laughs> that I was going to take my pain and turn it into purpose and pay it forward to help others. But my heart and my personal thought was because I don't want anybody else to feel alone like I did. Um, and so I would just document the things that were helpful and the things that were unhelpful. You know, part of it was me journaling for therapy, but, uh, part of it was also because I had that notion that I needed to use this experience to help others. So I started down this journey, uh, after I was let go, <laughs> you know, that was a moment where I'm, I literally get my box of stuff. I go down to the car, I'm sitting there sobbing, like what again, now what, what am I supposed to do with this? Wow. And I remember thinking, what am I supposed to do? And then it was like, I changed the tone. I was like, wait, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, I can literally do anything at this point. <laughs> and it had been on my heart for about a month that I wanted to do something. And at first I thought it was going to be a nonprofit, but I wanted to do something to help people transition um, back to work and for the leaders and for their colleagues to know how to interact with them. So how do we manage grief in the workplace and not just send them away mm -hmm. to a counselor or penalize them if they do need to take more time off because they are emotionally and mentally you know, checked out? And so I started to kind of formulate what those um, offerings would look like. But I found out very quickly that people do not want to talk about grief at work. <laughs> not only are they uncomfortable with it on a personal level, but bring it into the workplace and it's like, it's a no-go. <laughs> yeah. So thank God for Sheryl Sandberg, because, you know, a couple of years after Richard died, when her husband David died, she really, you know, stands at the forefront of addressing this issue. And even reading her book, Option B, I don't know, have either of you read that before? No, I have no, but I've had it here yeah. for a long time, yeah. Yes, it's yeah. so great. It's so great. And I felt like I was reading my journal. All the things that I wanted to share with people, she had so much of that in her, um, in her book. And so it really was nice to see that, yes, this is a universal human experience. And things that I was thinking, I'm not crazy. This is what we should be sharing with others. So it was great to see that. But, you know, I didn't have the, the resources or the manpower to really break through that wall to make people... Um, accept this reality and also be more proactive about their approach to grief. And so I thought to myself, well, okay, if I were to readjust this message, how can I still help them with this problem, but not focus on the problem and focus on the solution? And that's where I started to create more um, uh, available resources that were centered around compassion and empathy, because what I found was, and, and I'm a nerd for positive psychology, so anything positive psychology, I am digging deep into that research. Mm -hmm. And so what I found was when we exercise compassion and empathy on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, in how we're listening in a meeting and how we're interacting in the hallways, if we do that on the day-to-day, -day, then it's mastery preparation for the time of crisis. And so mm -hmm. I just, I, I, again, I pivoted away from looking at just grief and I said, well, hold on, how are we talking about, um, or, or how are we managing and interacting and engaging with one another on uh, in our everyday lives, because a lot of times it is very surface level and especially in work, it's only numbers driven. And I think what people fail to realize is when you bring compassion and empathy to the table, it's not just about hard times. You're actually opening the door to more creativity. You're mm -hmm. opening the door to um, more problem solving because you're allowing people to be their whole self without being criticized or judged or put down, even if they're wrong, that's still getting the juices flowing, right? And so it was in that space though, that I also started thinking about, okay, this is a great solution for corporations, but I still feel tied to telling my story and how I changed my mindset. And that's going to be more set for the individual, because even if I interact with an in individual and I help them to change their mindset, that can still impact the organization because now they're showing up differently in life and at work.
And so while I have those, you know, leadership uh, trainings available that again are very human centric and they're focused on compassion and empathy and, and our interactions with those behaviors, um, my, my soul on fire purpose is to really help people to create a healthy mindset. Because again, when you cultivate that healthy mindset, you can get through anything. I mean, you can get through a difficult coworker. You can get through cancer. I, ha I know cancer survivors who, because of their mindset, their experience was way different than people who did mm -hmm. not have that same growth mindset, as mm -hmm. Carol Dweck calls it. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I, I love living in both of those spaces. I love helping corporations and, and getting them to see the value of putting their people first and giving them the tools that they need to successfully do that. But I also love working with individuals and helping them to um, open their mind and open their heart to take care of their total well-being and more specifically their mind so that they can just, they can be their best self. Because think about it, if we all show up as our best self, we're all winning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a cumulative, like a exponential thing, isn't it? When, when everyone is just doing like in the right headspace and you, you're all like feeding off that together to yes. move forward. It's, it's a great thing that you're doing. Can you just maybe talk briefly about um, something that we've spoken about before and, and there's some semantics to do with um, compassion and empathy. Um, I don't know. Have, have you, cause some people say, well, you know, you shouldn't have too much empathy because then you, you know, you're bringing yourself down into their place. You need to have the energy separate from it. Do you know what I mean? Have, have you sort of yeah. thought these sort of um, concepts through in, in that, from that perspective as well? Well, it's kind of, you know, that goes back to the notion and the mindset of, I don't want to get too close to your grief because then you're going to bring me down. So I'm going to keep you away with some, you know, insensitive remarks. So that's not changing my energy, but that's also, um, that is, have you ever heard of the crab in the bucket effect? No, <laughs> you have a bunch of crab. Uh, well, I'm from the Northeast so Maryland, Eastern shore, <laughs> right? But okay. So if you have a bunch of crabs in a bucket and you see them trying to get up, Usually they're trying to bring that one down, the one that's getting up. Oh, wow. If you have that mentality that you're bringing other people down, then this, isn't, this message isn't even going to resonate with you. But if you realize that you can show up as your whole self and be a positive impact on others and meet them where they are, then you're thinking with more of an abundance mindset, right? And that's where you also recognize that we are all connected through the human spirit. And so because of that, no matter where you are, I'm going to show up with the energy that I need so that you can grasp onto that. Because then I am now your source of hope. I'm your source of strength. I am a, a testimony that gives you a vision of where you want to go. I'm showing up and I'm giving you a pathway. It, it's not opposite. And if it is opposite, it's only because of that person's mindset and right. they're stuck in that already. Um, but I do think that there is, um, there is a huge value in showing up as your whole self because we're not perfect and we're not robots. And so if you expect people to show up at work and they are robotic and they're switching off their emotions, then that's unrealistic. We literally cannot do that. And even if you think, okay, they have switched off their emotions or their per they left their personal baggage at the door, internally, that's causing more stress. That's causing more damage. It's actually uh, depleting brain chemicals that help you to heal because you're suppressed. So you're doing more damage than you are good by asking them to suppress those very natural emotions as opposed to allowing them to be their whole self and then they can progressively move forward. Right. But it's still, like you said, it's very difficult to actually kind of do this in the workplace, you know, like, cause you, you, you're kind of making everyone vulnerable and, uh, that's also, it's, it's weird. Like vulnerability in the workplace is like, it's kind of seen as the wrong thing to do. Cause you bit like weak, you're kind of seen as like a weakness and you're, you're not, you know, maybe the, the star employee that's going to sort of strive to, mm. to become whoever um but we can so, change that no 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 of course i know i'm just I, we, I we're totally with you but i'm just saying this is the the issue with the, with corporate culture you know like i remember i was i was an investment banker for 20 years and if i had to ever tell my boss that there was basically you know something wrong or whatever like oh you know i'm not feeling great or whatever the story is i'm suffering from this they'll be like well you should just sort that out then and come back when you're ready you know what Suck i mean it up. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. so so it's great that we're going through this transition, I guess, and people are like mm -hmm. you are sort of spreading these sort of messages. 
And, you know, vulnerability is not always about like uh, griefs and grief and hardships. And we're not, ex I'm not saying that you should take all of your personal stuff to work and expect anybody to be your counselor, you know, <laughs> like that's yeah. not what I'm saying. Vulnerability and, and even showing empathy, expressing empathy on the other side of that is when you say, I've reached a point in this project where I'm not sure what to do. Let me be vulnerable and ask for help. Mm. Let me yeah. go to somebody else who's strong in this data or in this piece of technology and ask them. And what happens is we usually will not ask for help because we then think we're not seen as smart or we're not able to do that. And so then we don't ask questions and errors may occur on the back end. So if we allow people to be their whole self, including asking for help, there's actually, I'll have to find this article and I can send it over to you so you can uh, put it in the show yeah. notes. But there's this article that actually shows how when you ask for help and when you create a culture where people are, are allowed to ask for help, it actually strengthens their trust. Mm. Yeah, who makes doesn't sense. want to work? Who does, right. Who doesn't want to work in a place where you can trust your colleague to not judge you, but to help you get to the finish line. And then that's also celebrating because you're saying, I know you can do this. I see this value in you and I may not be able to, but I'm coming to you to help me. Like that again is strengthening a relationship. So, I mean, listen, we can start going down the, the uh, Brene <laughs> Brown rabbit hole with vulnerability, but I do think that most most of what we need to break through is it's not a sign of weakness. And that doesn't mean that you are any less of uh, capable or, or, or smart or even just less of a person because you're asking for help or saying, I don't have it all together. In fact, it shows the opposite because vulnerability does take strength. That's amazing. That's, uh, <laughs> I think we, we, we so easy to judge and, and we, we sort of, you can almost picture like us versus them scenarios in those workplaces. But as soon as some people start to go down this road, you, you, you're giving them permission to actually to also feel that. And we all want to help other people on some level. So yes. I guess it does create that, like we just need to break that cycle that it's, that we've been in from the past of like stoicism in the workplace and like stiff up a lip. And, and, and I, I suppose it just takes time. But once you start to get into that place, it just becomes happier for everybody, I guess. But so you've, you've, I mean, you speak so well, Karen, and um, you've, you've taken um, the stage of TEDx in the form of TEDx talks and, and these kind of things. You've also got um, two courses, um, uh, Cleansing Habits and, your, and the Heal, it, uh, Heal Forward course. Um, maybe you can just be a little bit more specific about what you're doing with those. Yes. So this is uh, tailored to the individual. So when I created Heal Forward and I wanted to create an e-course because when people are going through the thick of a storm, they may not always want to have that interaction or accountability. So they, and for me, you know, even finding a counselor or finding a coach, it was really, really hard and it was expensive. <laughs> so I wanted to create uh, an affordable resource for people where they are getting kind of walked through uh, different habits that can help them to jumpstart their healing. Because this is what I found at the center of my healing. If I could take care of my total well being, then I'll be able to make better decisions. So if you're taking care of your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well being, then at the very least, even if you can't show up as 100%, at least you are making clear and healthy decisions. And so that's what Heal Forward is intended to do, is to give people different habits that worked for me. I do not share anything that I haven't done myself, but they help specifically in those four areas of, of your well-being. And then again, that's a, a well-rounded approach because listen, we're complex beings. We are ridiculously human, right? <laughs> and, <Exactly>. so, <laughs> and so you have to learn how to take care of your total well-being so that you can show up fully. And I know that there's a lot of um, people say, oh, well, you have to, you should take care of others. And why are you taking, you, you know, taking care of yourself is selfish. But really, if you take care of yourself first, then you can take care of others from overflow. And that's how we are designed. That's how we should. We should always take care of ourselves first, not in a selfish way, but that helps us to be our best self for others. So that's what Heal Forward is intended to do. It's an e-course. It's at your own pace. You can sign up. And then in six weeks, you're going to have a ton of healthy habits that will help you to just at least start to build that unbreakable foundation. 
I was actually listening to a podcast today with uh, Seth Godin and Tim Ferriss, a really great one actually. And um, Seth was talking about e-courses and these sort of things. And actually the, the finish rate of them is like, it's almost like less than 10%. Is, and, and, and that's why he's created his course, the Alt MBA, which has a different structure to it where there's a community and that. How do you um, try to like sort of make sure that people get through your, your courses? Well, any way. Seth and I are on the same page. <laughs> so what I decided was that, again, Heal Forward is great if somebody says, I'm not really uh, at the point where I want to be involved or immersed in, uh, in a connection or in a community. But then there are people who are a little beyond that. They have the growth mindset. They know they want to grow through it. And they do want that accountability and connection. And so I created a master, a master class community called Soul Care. So Soul Care is like every single month we are diving into different topics. We are unpacking different uh, books or I'm having, <clears throat> excuse me, guest coaches on there from all around the world. And we're just peeling back the layers of life because I do think that, you know, you can, for example, do an e-course or maybe you can give a keynote or do a workshop. And that's a very limited impact because very rarely are people saying, oh, let me pull this out six weeks later when I'm really going through the thick of another storm, you know? Yeah. So when you get involved in a, like a masterclass community, like, like soul care, then every month you are being poured into it's we're doing life together and I think that's where you really start to see the change again e-courses are great if you're like oh I, I need a, a snack or I kind of want to do this at my own pace but I think if you really want to see your life change get involved and and you know Coaching is also great one-on-one, -on -one, but I feel like group coaching, there's a different dynamic and energy that's shared when you're connected with other people who have the same mindset. And then you're sharing, you know, those vulnerable moments and you're also sharing your wins. And that's how that energy continues to just perpetuate and grow. Mm, yeah, for sure. Like it's super powerful just having others there as a, even just a support system or whatever it is, you know, and, 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 and ideas and, and everything else. Um, so it sounds like you, you have it waxed there, which is awesome. <laughs> yes, um, yes, uh, so, so just, I just want to find out like it's, it's, are they, you know, you're trained um, in, in helping people deal with grief. Um, I know you've mentioned a lot of things already, like, you know, throughout the chat and, and they probably, you'll probably might repeat them in answer to this, but um, are there any specific, tools or recommendations that you have for people that are kind of grieving on, I guess, any sort of level? Yeah. So when I thought about how did I really move through my journey, there were four areas that stuck out to me. Um, the first one is creating healthy boundaries. You know, whether it's with toxic people or whether it's being connected to social media too much and you need to create a healthy boundary with that consumption or negative news, you know, I stopped watching the news. I don't watch scary movies. Like you have to create those healthy boundaries physically and emotionally and mentally, mentally and so on. Um, so that's the first thing I thought of. And then I thought to myself, well, I also had to learn how to um, embrace emotions. Otherwise we're suppressing them, which then, as I mentioned before, they start to come out in unhealthy ways. So if you learn how to embrace those emotions, then you decrease the risk of uh, finding yourself in a deep depression um, or even just flying off the cuff at the wrong time. <laughs> and then I also recognize that a uh, part of the healing journey is accepting what has happened. It doesn't mean that that's okay, but it does mean when you practice acceptance, that means that you acknowledge your starting point okay, I know this has happened. I may not feel good about it, but this is where I am today and this is how I want to move forward. And then the last piece of that is I had to learn how to love myself. You know, I had to put my oxygen mask on first before I could even take care of my son, who was mm. my motivation. And so what I just mentioned to you, H-E-A-L, heal, is the method that I realized this is exact, these are the steps that I took. This is exactly my pathway back to a whole heart. So I did create a fun infograph. Uh, it's called the heal method and you can go onto my website and just download it. And, and it's, it gives the framework, but he, the heal, uh, forward e-course and also soul care, that's what dives deeper into each of those four areas. Um, but I do have a fun technique that I would love to share with your audience if that's please. okay. Yeah, please do. 
So this is not even, you don't have to be grieving to practice this, this technique, but it's a mindfulness technique. Cause I told you that's where my mind, my life started to change was in my mind. And so what happens is for some reason, our default uh, thinking space is negative. Like we all have that inner critic, right? That's saying, who do you think you are to start this podcast? And why do you think that you could do, you know, that just, or why are you leaving this job? There's security here. Don't try to be better. Like there's this inner critic that can literally create a negative thought cycle that will paralyze us from being our best self. And so if we're able to see our thoughts as separate than us, then we can start to move them in the right direction. So I created this technique called stop and shift. STOP stands, stands for silence thoughts on purpose. That's the first thing you need to do. You need to quiet the negative thought cycle, that inner critic. You need to shut them up, right? You do not have to be controlled by them. But then you have to shift it into a direction that's going to be positive and productive. If you quiet that thought, eventually more thoughts are going to creep up. But if you intentionally move it in a direction that is going to benefit you or benefit the other person or just, you know, the scenario, then that's how you're going to be able to just increase your quality of life. So shift stands for see hope, see intentions, see facts, or, and then see new thoughts. So in any situation, you're going to silence those thoughts on purpose, and then you're going to shift to see either intentions, um, I'm sorry, hope, intentions, or facts. That helps you to move from a negative space into a positive and productive space. And I have a ton of information, um, information on stop and shift, but that's a technique that people can start using right now. So when you say facts, Karen, do, do, do you mean like what, what is real right now as part of the Correct. stop and shift? Yeah. Correct. And there's so many different examples of that, but here's one from my story. When I was feeling like, woe is me, and I was in this victim mindset, which again, I had every right to feel like a victim. I mean, you've heard my story. So yeah. instead of me uh, being bitter, I had to think to myself, wait, hold on, Karen, you're not the only widow in the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have every right to be upset, but you are not the only person who, one, lost their spouse or two, lost their spouse because of a, a heinous crime. Mm. So that allowed me to stop throwing this pity party and living in this pity party and redirect to a more productive way. And in that case, I uh, actually, I thought about the facts and I thought, okay, how can I use this to help other widows? So I thought outside of my space. Mm. And can you also just talk real briefly, uh, people say, it's you hear it a lot and I'm still trying to sort of understand it a little bit within myself is, you should love yourself more. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that really? Like, what, does it mean forgiveness? Does it mean, uh, what is this process that one needs to work on to love yourself more? And what does it really mean? There's so much to that. I mean, that's a whole nother show, but I will give <laughs> you what my personal sentiment is. I think to love yourself more is to not allow other to pr others to project their expectations onto you. So if you're going through a tough time and somebody tells you, you need to get over it, you don't have to accept that. Mm. You don't have to then think, oh, well, they must be right because no, 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 you listen to yourself. You listen to your needs. You honor your emotions in the space that you're in and you move through it at your pace. But love yourself is also on a day to day. Like if you are constantly taking care of your partner and your kids and work and volunteer, and you're just going, going, going. And the only time you have to yourself is when you're asleep, <laughs> you are not mm. loving yourself, right? Yeah. You do need to take care of your body. You do need to take time to, to care for your mind, which may mean quiet time, 30 minutes mm. if you can get it, 15 minutes if you can get it. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you should absolutely be carving out that time to look inward and say, okay, what do I need to be my best self? If your mind is all over the place, you need to do something probably with you know, meditation or even exercise. Exercise is a great form of meditation. It's just more physical, right? <laughs> but, but if you are going through a really tough time, then loving yourself is not letting other people um, dictate how you should be healing or grieving or experiencing the loss or change that is your story and not theirs. Yeah. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Well said. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. It's a tricky one, right? Because we're, yeah. we're kind of, we're taught to always take care of other people and we're made yeah. to feel bad if we don't, if we don't sacrifice enough for others, but think about it like your bank account. 
If you're constantly getting all of these withdrawals, right? Eventually your account is going to be what? Negative. It's going to go into the negative because you're not putting any deposits back in. That is you. You need to deposit into yourself as much as you are allowing others to withdraw from you. Mm. And like you said earlier, when you, when you have surplus, when you, when you're overflowing, that's when you can really help others, you know, and that's, yes. that's a cool analogy. Yep. So one of the things you, um, you, you're doing is, is you sort of touched on it a little bit is, is teaching organizations around human centric leadership, uh, which very much resonates with Gareth and I, um, what does that really mean in that context? And, and, um, why is it so important? Well, there are different levels, but first it's about understanding that your business is not driven by numbers. Your business is driven and created and thriving because of its people. I don't care how much AI you have interwoven into your business. There are people (laughs) behind that as well. And so first is acknowledging that when you take care of your people, your people will take care of your business. And that's actually my favorite Richard Branson quote. It's so true. It is. And you know, I mentioned this to you earlier. I really admire uh, Gary Vee and not because he's a master marketing hustler, but because of the way he's created a culture that says, listen, if you need to take time out, go, I'm not even asking you when you're coming back if something tragic happened, right? Or if you had a baby or if you need to take a vacation. So it's really just understanding that you're not working with robots, that you have people who are behind the success of your business. And with those people, you have to consider that they are human, that life happens. And so you should be able to uh, walk alongside them when those moments happen. That is creating a human centric workplace. And also again, in your day-to-day interactions with one another, Are you interacting with compassion and empathy? A great example is if you have somebody who's not doing a great job, you could either come down on them, tell them how horrible they are, put them on an action plan that looks like you're going to be letting them go in the next three to six Mm. months, or you can sit down and say, hey, I see that you're kind of struggling with this. What's going on? You know, is there something I can do better to support you? Would you like additional training? Do you need a little more time with this? Do you feel like I have um, set you up for success? Do you have everything you need to get this project done in this time? Instead of coming down on them, which is then going to make them, what, close up. They're not going to want to tell if they're having any issues. And then maybe other problems are happening in the background. Instead, you're choosing to coach with compassion then you are creating this trust, which will be unbreakable. And that's what increases people's loyalty. They know that they can trust you and they know that you are treating them like a human. That, I mean, right there, as a matter of fact, there was this great study um, uh, done by Google. It's called Project Aristotle. And they wanted to find out what is the difference between our high performing teams and everyone else. And now they didn't go out looking for empathy, but that's exactly what they found. Their high performing teams operated with an enormous amount of empathy. They would just check in and have regular conversation with one another. They would start off every meeting instead of looking at their phones, their phones were down and they were talking to the person next to them. They knew if somebody, you know, uh, their kid was going through something hard or if they had a health issue, they did not, again, set out to look for empathy. They wanted to find out the difference between their high performing teams and others. And empathy was that difference. Hmm. Interesting. Mm, that's so cool. I often think, and like this is what Craig and I talk about things like the the problem is complex, but the solution is so simple. You know. Oh my gosh! Yes. It's, it's like, and and almost like obvious, but we actually don't do these things sometimes. Like you know, like just sitting there talking to your colleague before a meeting starts, rather than being on your phone or whatever the story is like these are big things, you know, like, and then they, they do shift companies and, and teams and the results of meetings and all these sort of things. And yet we kind of ignore them and we think they may be kind of a bit woo wooey or sort of things that it's really is like simple things. You know, we, we cannot forget that we are people at the end of the day and uh, we have emotions and kind of emotions do drive us. You know what I mean? A lot of the time. And uh, we need to sort of recognize that. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, another great thing to do is to start off your meetings and say, hey, tell me about a memory from elementary school. Mm. Because oftentimes when we're interacting with one another, we see them as their job title yeah. or their responsibilities on a project that we're collaborating mm. on. 
And so if you start to ask more questions that it's not like, okay, unload on me on what's happening at home right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's like, just tell me about who you are as a person. I always ask those questions, especially at dinner time. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> like, okay, let's talk about this because I'm so intrigued. But I think again, it, it helps us to see other people as human who have real life experiences, not just this, you know, cookie cutter stamp a job mm -hmm. title on them. So important. Yeah. Eh? Um, I actually did a talk, uh, I think about two weeks ago at a company here in London. And um, one of the things was actually being curious. And uh, I actually got them to do like an exercise at the end of the talk. And I was like, okay, using curiosity, communication and caring, which is what I spoke about. So I was like, go and uh, speak to somebody here in the audience that you maybe haven't spoken to before. And, and ask them some questions about who they are. And then, you know, and then afterwards I asked like for any cool stories and uh, there was like some really cool stories. Like one of the guys, he had grown up, I think it was in Lebanon, like it was a war-torn um, city and country. And like, you know, these are things that, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, like I bet you now that sort of instigates more conversation. And it's these sort of things, like you said, taking an interest in each other, taking an interest in your, in your, um, your colleagues and your personnel that's what kind of makes people want to be there and builds that trust, which is just so important. And again, yeah. it's so simple. Just give people a bit of time, ask them questions. Yes. Yes. And not only will you feel like, Oh my gosh, that's interesting, but you may even find a commonality that connects you even more. Exactly. That's it. That's that you wouldn't have known if you weren't just curious. I love exactly. that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so one of the things which we, which we actually sort of find that gets asked us quite a fair a bit, um, or not asked, but like um, people kind of say it to us, and um, how have you uh, kind of dealt with everything being a single mom um, and, and not just sort of, you know, I guess with what happened, but also now you're like a, a businesswoman and you're a single mom as well. Like how do you do everything? I don't. <laughs> if, I, if I can be quite honest, I don't. I actually, um, I had to send an email to somebody the other day. We said we were going to do this uh, collaborative article and I was all into it. Yeah, sure. And then all of these engagements popped up, uh, other obligations that, you know, were more demanding. And I had to send her an email and say, I'm really sorry. I did not get to this. And I actually need to push it back a couple of weeks. Would that be okay with you? She said, sure. She was totally understanding. So I think in order for me to keep my sanity, I can't do everything. And, and my son is eight, he's busy. So mm. it's not like I you know, have a 14 year old who can maybe semi, you know, take care of a few things. No, I get tired of cooking and taking out the trash <laughs> and doing everything. Um, he's very, very, very helpful. Um, but I just, I've had to learn, like, I need to set healthy boundaries, right? I, I'm also, uh, as I like to say, a recovering perfectionist. So <laughs> I put a lot of pressure on myself when I do things. I have to do it super, super perfect. And I realize that if I just start doing it, even if it's not perfect, it's still helping me to refine whatever it is in my business that I want to get out there. Um, and the result of that is heal forward and soul care. You know, I had to start somewhere. And mm -hmm. so I think that for me, I'm very uh, conscious also about resting. I am not answering emails past a certain time. You know, I specifically between the hours of like four and eight, I'm not available to anybody. That's my time with my son. Mm -hmm. I may do some work after hours because I'm really creative at night. I don't know why, but mm -hmm. I, so I will maximize, you know, those two or two and a half hours before I go to bed and I will work after Caleb goes down. Mm -hmm. um, I think that another thing is flexibility, you know, kind of understand the season that you're in. Early on when I was starting off my business, I could work until two or three o'clock in the morning and I was like burning the midnight oil on a daily basis. Now I'm in bed at 1030 and I have to make sure that I get adequate sleep. Um, but it's, I also think that having a good support system around you, um, you know, I don't have a lot of family where I live, but I have really, really great friends who are very willing to uh, help me out if I have a speaking engagement or if I need to travel or if I just need some, you know, downtime during the summer and I need to clear out my mind. Okay, good. Caleb has a place to go play. Um, I will tell you that I have so much respect for single parents in a way that I never understood before. It is tiring and it is so hard to balance between um, you know, the demands of having everything ready and good and, and like 
working like a well-oiled machine at home and also trying to give your best when it comes to work. And so I think the best way that you can try and find that balance is releasing that pressure of perfection and also mm -hmm. leaning on your tribe and your community to, um, to help you out. And, and that was also hard for me too, because I never wanted to be a burden on anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I've had some people who are really close to me have a very honest conversation and say, we want to be there for you. Just like you want to be there for others, let us be there for you. And that helped mm -hmm. me to kind of open my heart to receive that, that support. I like that. So amazing. You know, like uh, it just reminded me when you were saying that about how those people are like real heroes. Like my wife's, my wife's um, mom was a single mom with twins and, and hearing your story and, and th those are actually hero stories. Seriously. Like how do you actually, like it's, it's, it's literally impossible for me to almost imagine how tough that must be to try and, yeah, um, fits it all in and just put a smile on your face when you leave the house and, and not feel like there's so much pressure on you. So just thanks for those um, great reminders for people. Cause I think um, it also someone like myself, who's not a single parent can go, well, you know, like if you're doing that, like seriously, I need to make a plan in my life with certain things and, and instill the boundaries and things like that, even though I don't have that much pressure, but if you can, that means I can, do you know what I mean? And so it's just, once again, just thanks for sharing these things. And it's kind of, I guess, a segue into the question I wanted to ask is, you know, what, what is the importance of people telling and sharing their stories in your opinion? Oh man, you know, I just feel like, I think I might have said this earlier that when you share your story and I mean everything, not just the high part, right? Not just the stuff you put on social media, but when you really share your story, you don't know who you are inspiring to push through some really tough times that, that they're trying to manage. You know, you can be an example. And I'm not saying that you have to make this grand gesture just by showing up with a positive outlook or being willing to, to help other people and having a, you know, operating from a, a clean heart that just shows people that, okay, this thing that happened to me doesn't define me. And if you're even just that example to them, then that's going to create a ripple effect in this world that can really start a healing movement. I mean, man, yeah. I am so on fire for creating a healing movement and really being a part of that. And that's why, man, I love the, the Sheryl Sandbergs and the Brene Browns and the Mel Robbins who are all sharing really the knit and the Gary V's who, you know, said, man, I was failing all through school, but I still pressed forward. Like, I admire that because I think that if we can share those dark spaces, then we are again releasing the, the pressure of trying to be perfect and we're giving hope to other people who may just not have it around them right now or even within them. And so don't be afraid to share, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly because you never know how it can inspire somebody else's life. Amazing advice as always. <laughs> um, just the last bit of advice, which, I, which I'd like to, you know, if you could share with us, please. Um, you talk about all these people and, and even yourself, like, you know, you come over as like a super confident uh, person. I mean, and, and that's, that, that, that's not the case with everybody though. You know, a lot of people uh, suffer with like self-esteem and low confidence and all these sort of things. So how like can you sort of encourage people or get them on the path to building up their self-confidence and resilience? Um, yeah, you know, any, any tools or advice on that front? Yes, absolutely. I didn't realize that one of the side effects of grief was going to be losing my confidence because I've always been a very confident and kind of independent person. Even when I was married, um, I didn't feel like I lost myself. And so when I lost Richard, that kind that, that struck me as odd. Why am I losing my confidence with this? And what I started to do was to keep track of, there were a couple of things I did. Like I had a gratitude journal and I had a journal just of my emotions, but then I also had a journal of confidence checkpoints. Hmm. And so confidence checkpoints are really just little moments where you did overcome that hard moment or you did get up that day and you didn't want to, or you did make it to an event, or you did give a really awesome talk. And so I started to actually do this when I became an entrepreneur. And I, side note, we had no money. Like I didn't have life insurance. We didn't, I don't have social security. I don't get any, I started from ground zero with all this. And the little bit of money that I got from selling our house, I used to take care of our debt. 
And I had just enough to invest in somebody to do my website. And it was a waste. A oh huge my God. waste. No way. And so I had to teach. And matter of fact, I had three different people who were building my website and all of it like was terrible. Oh. So now this is my first taste of being an entrepreneur. And I'm thinking if I can't get a website done, how am I going to get my business up and running? So you know what I did? I taught myself how to build a website. And if you look at my website now, that is all me. I literally had to master not only how to build a website, but also marketing. Because again, I don't have a ton of resources that I'm pouring in for somebody else to do my marketing, my eBooks or my infographs, all of that is me. So when I first built my website, that was my confidence checkpoint. If I can build a freaking website, I can do anything. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about it. (laughs) And and so that's what helped me to move forward though. That's what gave me when I had to build an ebook and I was thinking, man, how am I going to do this? Nope. I looked back at those times. I looked back at the website I did. I looked back at the, the contract that I was able to close. I looked back at the speaking gigs that I was able to get. And so it doesn't have to be business related. It can be life related, but if you can just document those times, where you were able to do whatever it was before. You know, early on it was like, wow, I got up and I took a shower today. That is a confidence checkpoint. I am moving forward, right? So it can be big or it can be small, but if you can look back at all those little wins, then that's going to give you the fuel that you need to move forward and to press forward. Mm -hmm. Such valuable tools. Thank you for that. And yeah, I've just, uh, I've got so many notes to to (laughs) read through and just to think through. Thank you. So look, you've given us such so much value today. Thank you so much. But obviously, uh, we'd love to hear like what you're planning moving forward. You're busy with so many great things. And also at the same time, you can just tell um, our listeners uh, where people can actually contact you. Yeah, so I'm really excited because I am writing a book and it is about stop and shift. Because I think it's about time that uh, I get something in people's hands. <laughs> and so I'm really excited about that book. Um, and I am, I'm speaking everywhere and anywhere. I am looking to expand this and take it international. So thank you for inviting me on your, your podcast. <laughs> Um, but I, I am just excited about spreading this, this message, whether it's through soul care and individuals lives being changed or whether it's through the book when it's ready to be released, stop and shift. Um, but anything that I'm working on, you can certainly find on my website, karenmillsap.com and that's Millsap with two L's. I have a ton of free resources, free resources on there, infographs and eBooks and, and other podcasts and all, I mean, so much stuff out there. I, I never want anybody to feel like they can't afford healing or they don't have access to the tools to change their mindset. Um, So if you just go to my website, you can contact me or you can also find uh, a a ton of resources. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And your website is awesome. So you've done an amazing job at at learning (laughs) how to do that because I know exactly how difficult websites are to build and (laughs) your one just looks beautiful as well. So you've done a superb job. (laughs) It's funny actually, Gareth, because I actually, when I, you know, know, doing the research with you and what have you, I also thought, geez, this is such a nice website, which is interesting. Yeah. Like that's (laughs) one of the things I actually thought. So like, seriously, well done. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I also encourage people when you go onto the website and you know, you all probably saw this there is an opportunity for you to sign up for this seven day free soul cleanse that's a really great way to also jump start like getting some healthy habits and and just looking at you know what does it look like to take care of myself you asked craig like how do i love myself the seven day soul cleanse is free and it's uh, a week worth of really self-loving habits cool that's Thank really you. cool well thanks for sharing that with us and then just our last question um, just before we kind of say thank you, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Mm. It means being brave and stepping into who you were created to be. Mm. Nice. Very nice. simple. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's what's it's simple, but it's so hard. Mm-hmm. It's so hard to look inward and say, well, how was I created? And, and how do I bring that to the world? but we're all human. And I think that when you are brave about just figuring out what sets your soul on fire, that is what ridiculous, ridiculously human looks like. Cool. Yeah, powerful. It. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> hey, uh, I don't even know where to start, to be honest with you. This has just been like such an incredible chat. Seriously. Um, Craig and I, we run a, a separate podcast or well, it's part of this, but like a bonus series called superhumanship, which, which is all around sort of, 
micro leadership and micro influence and being a kind of better person. And so we re listen to every single podcast kind of we before we do that. And I'm just thinking now, I'm like, wow, this is going to be such a great podcast. And like, yeah. how are we going to sort of select only a few of the amazing things that you've actually said to us? Because we try and keep that podcast to like, you know, maximum 20 minutes, but we're going <laughs> to definitely have to go over 20 minutes for that one. So, <laughs> um, Sorry. No, 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 not at all. The best it's way. It's amazing having these sort of choices. So uh, seriously, Karen, um, you, you're such an incredibly um, powerful lady and um, inspiring lady too. And uh, I mean, it's, it's impossible to imagine like what you have been through um, in terms of the tragedy that you experienced with uh, Richard being murdered. Um, but, uh, you know, how you've sort of dealt with that and, and the place you're in now and just the kind of the way you hold yourself, um, it's, it's so special. And, and you have like this just incredible energy about you and, and your smile. I can only imagine like you walk into a room and you just lift people up because, um, because that's what it does. You know what I mean? And, and, and also like you're just super charismatic and uh, this is like, um, it's just such a nice thing to see, you know what I mean? And then it just sort of changes the sort of the air in the room and just kind of lifts everybody up. So you've been such a great guest and there's been so many lessons here. And I can only imagine that like if uh, your clients have you one-on-one -on -one, that you just kind of really transform their lives and then the, the other people that you have in your group coaching once again as well, you know, and uh, I have no doubt about it that taking this international is going to be no problem for you whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm super excited for you about your book. That's amazing. So uh, just you're yeah, well done for everything you've done. And um, just thanks for the way you tell your story. And it's just been an honor to have you as a guest on our show. Oh, thank you so much. I'm like blushing. My cheeks are hurting. That was such an incredible compliment. I appreciate that. I hope if anybody feels anything, they just know that, you know, when they're, when they're talking to me or when they're hearing my story, I mean, the good and the bad, it's real. You know, mm. it's, it's, it's mm. authentic. It's genuine. And um, you know, the hard moments and the positivity that I've learned to cultivate, you know, it comes from a very real space. So thank you very much for that compliment. I appreciate it. My pleasure. pleasure. And just briefly from my side, Karen, like, look, I couldn't agree more with what Gareth said. And just a few things that I just wanted to just mention. First of all, you, you'd mentioned that you were feeling a little bit rough this morning. And you also spoke about your, your soul being on fire for something. And the whole time I was just thinking, you know, even though you weren't feeling great, your fire, your, your fire was burning strong. Like you can just tell that you're on fire for the stuff you're talking about because you would never say you weren't feeling great. You know what I mean? Like you were just like on point the whole way. And so thank you. Like that's just super inspiring in and of itself. And um, a few other things like paying it forward. Like you, you're totally doing that. You've been through things and you're helping others. And it's those small things, as you said, be there for others it doesn't have to be a massive thing. And, and these are great reminders for us. Um, and you, you're really good at, uh, the word that came up when you were talking was bridging the human gap in my mind. I was like, you, you really got this thing that, that sort of, you know, when you were talking about the, um, uh, you know, compassion and that, you, you're just bridging that gap between people and, and giving us the tools to do that for others. So I really hope that... Um, people like take that as well because it's it's totally doable so definitely love doing life together i love that that point as well like let's do life together that's what it's all about isn't it and let's do this human thing as a team and uh, so so thanks for these reminders and uh, and really appreciate all your time and effort that you're putting into the world and uh, we can't wait for your future so thanks for joining us today Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I love that you guys are doing this podcast. Keep it up. You're killing it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. um, I would have thought you listened to all of them with all the information you got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 cool, cool. So yeah. how did you find the chat? It was so good. I love talking to you guys. I'm like, yeah, cool. are, we, are we cut from the same cloth? Clearly we are. Clearly yeah, we yeah. are. Yeah. But if we were even, meet up, if, yeah. I, I was like, exactly. Because I'm like, if we were in the same country, we'd be doing a lot of damage. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Definitely. Um. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Vol.